It's the middle of the night on April 26, 2014. It's pouring rain. It's cold. Grant Stiles, a commercial beekeeper, is in the middle of a blueberry field in Hamilton, New Jersey. Today marks the beginning of the pollination season, and Grant is racing against time. That wall of colorful boxes is over 400 beehives, more than 20 million bees, that just made a six-hour journey from North Carolina to here, and now must be distributed around these fields before the sun creeps up over the horizon. These bees aren't here to produce honey. They're here to pollinate crops. About one-third of the food we eat is made possible through honeybee pollination that commercial beekeepers like Grant provide. For example, in New Jersey, honeybees are used to pollinate blueberries, cranberries, apples, pears, cherries, strawberries, cucumbers, watermelon, cantaloupe, and pumpkins. Nationwide, that list is even greater. But here's the problem. You've seen the headlines. Since 2006, the United States honeybee population has suffered devastating losses, putting crops nationwide at risk and threatening the health of the beekeeping industry. If bee losses persist and U.S. pollination services can no longer be sustained, grocery stores would become food deserts. Whole Foods Market, for instance, predicts they would lose 52% of what they sell. So for Grant, working these fields in the middle of the night is more than just a job. He's fighting for a way of life, for his industry's survival, and he doesn't know if he will win. I like moving bees, I like being on the road, I like nature. Beekeeping puts all those things on the, in, you know, in one package for you. While the more familiar backyard beekeepers care for a few hives, their pollination impact is limited to a radius of just two miles. It's Grant, who has more than 3,000 hives, and the estimated 2,000 other commercial beekeepers in the U.S. who help put the food on your table. Each year, to meet the agricultural industry's growing demand for pollination services, these nomads haul 2.5 million hives and tractor trailers around the country, from farm to farm, from Florida to California to Maine, pollinating America's crops. Today is a big day. It's 9 a.m., we're back in the blueberry fields of New Jersey, and Grant's bees are getting their first checkup for this year's pollination season with Tim, the New Jersey State apiarist. My wife says I'm a rock star in the beekeeping world. We, we laugh about that because I don't look like a rock star, you know what I mean? 15. Think of Tim as a bee doctor. He's one of Grant's greatest allies in combating four major villains that are wreaking havoc on bee colonies everywhere. Pesticides, bacterial and viral diseases, Poor nutrition, which is caused by the lack of plant diversity bees face when forced to pollinate one crop at a time. And finally, and perhaps the most devastating of all, pests and parasites. Today, Grant and Tim are most concerned with a little pest called the Varroa mite. Varroa mites are the biggest stress in the beekeeping industry. They stress me out. People look to me for questions and I wish I could tell them, you know, the bottom line answer. It's a huge threat. To measure the risk posed to Grant's bees, they're doing a test. First, they grab a sample of 300 bees from each hive, submerge them in alcohol to dislodge any mites, then count the mites to get a general measure of the colony's health overall. For a beekeeper, losses are expected, and they're definitely nothing new. Since the 1940s, the total number of U.S. managed honeybee colonies has decreased from 5 million to only 2.5 million today. But in 2006, the magnitude of losses suddenly changed. That's when, according to the USDA, the combined effects of bad nutrition, pesticides, viruses, and pests led to a massive decline in bee populations. Beekeepers, whose average winter losses hovered around 10%, began reporting losses of 30 to 90% of their hives. This phenomenon is referred to as colony collapse disorder. Grant has no idea how many of his bees will survive this season. 
Already in this first checkup with Tim, he's noticed some of his bees looking sluggish and a little oily. Something's like messed up with some of them bees. They look wet. Fungicides. Hmm, that could be. It's more than just one or two. Yeah. It's like but that it, whole cluster. But it's not a virus. They don't really look like that with the different types of viruses that I've seen. I have friends that they lose 100% of their operation and they have to find somehow to, you know, borrow half a million dollars to get back into business and and then have have that chance to lose it all over again the following year. Why do I do it? I wish I had the answer to that, but it's just who we are. Grant's been around beekeeping his whole life. His father was a hobbyist, and as a child, Grant would watch him manage his hives in the backyard. It wasn't long before he was helping. When he went off to college at Penn State, majoring in entomology was a no-brainer. After graduation, he worked for a few commercial beekeepers before starting his own business. These days, beekeeping is a family affair. Grant has a wife and three stepchildren. While Grant follows his bees from North Carolina to New Jersey and upstate New York, Maria manages their store in Woodbridge. Everything okay in the shop? During the summer months, Grant works 16 to 20 hours a day, sometimes more, maintaining his hives and moving his bees in the dead of night, from blueberries to vine crops and then on to cranberries. On the few occasions he makes it home before the whole house is asleep, his stepson Chewy is there to help him finish off the day's work. It's a hard life, and after more than 20 years in this business, the heyday is gone. Costs are up, and every year since 2006, Grant has had to replace all of the queen bees in his hives, some of them more than once. And in the last two years, he's lost about 50% of his hives during the winter months. That die-off leaves him with fewer colonies to rent to farmers, which means his business makes less money and he's left with the expensive task of rebuilding his hives. For years now, the money Grant's gotten from pollination services hasn't been enough to cover his annual costs, and he's had to turn to honey production to make ends meet. Now, if he's lucky, if the weather cooperates, his honey crop is good, and if he's able to repopulate his hives, he might be able to scratch out a couple thousand dollars a month. Hey, Frank. Hey, Grant. The industry as a whole, not just me, um, is, is, is in dire straits. And to hold it all together has become extremely stressful and, and, and difficult, not knowing am I going to have bees next year to, you know, to feed my family. Back in the olden days, you could set your bees out and just let them go. There's no more of that. Daddy Harvey owns Harvey's Honey in Monroeville, New Jersey. Like Grant, she's a commercial beekeeper. Daddy has over 4,600 hives in her operation. She offers pollination services, sells her honey, and sells beekeeping supplies to backyard and commercial beekeepers. Daddy says she's seen pesticide use wreck the industry. She worries that if those chemicals are killing bees, it won't be long before humans feel the effects and that if we continue down this road, the United States may soon be forced to rely on hand pollination, like areas of central China do now. They have no more bees. And what they're doing is they have pollen in a cup, and they have all these people out there with paintbrushes, and they're dipping it in, in the cup and then dipping it all over the trees to pollinate the flowers because they don't have the bees. Is that what our society is going to come to? Dottie says the ongoing struggle to keep bees alive and healthy has forced commercial beekeepers to diversify. Here, in her wood room, she builds wooden beehive boxes that she sells to beekeepers and uses in her own operation. This season, Dottie says she'll rely on sales from these boxes to keep her business afloat. Like Grant, the money Dottie got from pollination services used to cover her costs. And she says it was a great trade-off, help provide Americans fresh fruits and vegetables, and make a living. When bee deaths led profits to slip, she turned to honey to fill the gap. But honey production is fickle, and so far this season, her yield is way down.
This season, as far as honey, horrible, horrible. If you don't make any honey, then you have to rely on the pollination. I mean, before the honey was like a bonus, you know, and you got the pollination money. This year, there's no bonus. That's fresh, that's brand new. There's the chance things could turn out just as bad for Grant, who's in upstate New York, with a group of bees he set aside specifically for honey production. Ooh, that's the juice. That's the nectar. That's the money in the honey. Don't let his excitement fool you. Grant is in a make or break situation. When he pulled his bees out of blueberries a month ago, he discovered 30% of them were missing from their hives. No clear reason, just gone. You walk into a, a, a location where the bees are and basically months of your hard work are dead. It's kind of gut-wrenching, it's depressing. And it's sad, you know, because there's really no good reason for it. Grant estimates this pollination season has put him in the hole $200,000. He even had to let one of his employees go. And the same situation is playing out for all the beekeepers in the state. Now, to survive this season, Grant will need a good honey harvest, which means he'll have to put everything he's got into producing it. Each drop of honey can mean the difference between profitability and financial failure. We have never had a pollination season this bad. How we really fix it, I, I don't know how to fix the industry at this point. I think, I think things in general are so broke they can't be fixed. This little bee is crawling its way out of what is called capped brood. You're watching a bee being born. And this brand new life could hold the key to Grant's future. It will be used by researchers in an experiment to measure the effects of pesticides on honeybee colonies in the hopes of mitigating bee deaths. That's just one of many experiments being conducted by entomologists and physiologists at the United States Department of Agriculture's Bee Laboratory in Beltsville, Maryland. Here, Judy, Stephen, Nathan, and Miguel are banking on one thing, that Grant's statement that the industry and the problems with bees can't be fixed is wrong. Their mission is to research the biology and control of what's killing bees, to ensure an adequate supply of bees for pollination and honey production. This place is fascinating. While Miguel's lab tests the effectiveness of nutritional supplements, ones Miguel created that are made of lemongrass and amino acids, Nathan is in the field finishing up a project that will hopefully pinpoint better ways to transport queen bees cross country. And these researchers actually work hand in hand with the nation's commercial beekeepers. So he's, he's just bringing more samples for us in, uh, from the post office. When Grant finds something wrong with his bees, like back in April when they were oily, his samples get sent here to Sam in the diagnostics lab. And like Grant, since 2006, their world has been turned upside down. You're trying to find a method, a single method, that can help beekeepers combat these, these problems without harming bees and without causing another factor to be introduced. Here's where they stand. I think we're getting close to uh, at least combating Varroa. So, and that, in a lot of people's minds, that's a big that's a really big factor because not only is it impacting the, the direct health of bees, but it also, um, they transmit viruses. They cause a decrease in the immune response of bees towards viruses. Uh, from zero to 10 of finding a solution, I mean, I would say probably around a six and seven. Controlling varroa mites, they say, would create a huge immediate change in the industry. But with three other factors and no clear-cut answers, there's still a long way to go. When you try to approach a commercial beekeeper who's just lost 30, 40, 50, 60, sometimes 90 percent of his colonies, and we don't have an answer, it's like uh, you, you can't even begin to, to, to sympathize with their frustration because they've lost their livelihood. I don't think the industry itself is going to die out, but I think there's going to be a huge paradigm shift in that 
some of the uh, agricultural commodities that rely on beekeepers may have to change how they um, farm these different crops. We can't just keep treating the bees the way we have been for so long. Dottie, for instance, envisions a future where there are stricter laws against the use of pesticides, while Grant imagines a world where beekeepers are reimbursed by farmers for the losses they incur while their bees are pollinating. But the adjustments needed to fix the industry extend beyond growers. Increased knowledge of what's plaguing commercial beekeepers leads to greater awareness of research like this, more responsible use of pesticides, and hopefully to more backyard beekeepers who help strengthen support for the beekeeping community. What began in April with blueberries in Hamilton now ends in October with honey production in upstate New York. Grant has just three weeks left before he pulls the curtain on this season. This is the uncapper to let the honey come out of the comb. Financially speaking, pollination services this year were fruitless. The $200,000 loss during blueberry season left Grant in dire need of a good honey crop just to make ends meet. Grant can best describe honey production as a gamble. When you've had a pollination season as devastating as his, he says, you're left with no choice but to make a bet against Mother Nature. That somehow, even though the odds are stacked against you, your bees will be able to produce enough crop to offset your losses. The only thing worse than placing the bet, having to wait three months for the turn of a spigot to know if you've won. The gamble we, we won on production side. Last year, you know, we were considerably hurt on our production. Basically, uh, I think it's gonna wind up being about a third of what it is this year. Our crew is, is, is happy, I'm happy. It looks like we're gonna be able to pay bills. We don't have to borrow more money uh, to keep going for next year. That's all positives, but it could have been so much better. Chances are next season, Grant will find himself in a similar predicament, reliant on honey production to make ends meet, hoping for a solution that may still be a few years away, knowing crop production in the U.S. would plummet if people like him didn't continue to fight. This industry can die. It can. It's, it's the hard-nosed people that are sticking with it. Sticking with it. Through it all, he'll cling to the positives. By now, Grant knows it's the only way to keep moving forward. I've devoted my whole life to this. And you don't give up on your whole life, okay? You, you find a way to succeed. And you know what, we're, we're in it. I didn't come this far to just walk out. Will you find the way? Beekeepers have always found the way, and I'm a beekeeper.